it is my pleasure to introduce to you our uh, keynote speaker. Usha Iyer is an assistant professor of film and media studies uh, here at Stanford, uh, whose research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of cinema, performance, and gender studies. Uh, she is working on a book project which examines the role of dance in the construction of female stardom in popular Hindi cinema from the 1930s to the 1990s. She is an affiliate faculty at the Center for South Asian Studies, which is one of the centers that is part of Stanford Global Studies, and will be a faculty fellow at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research in the next academic year. Her essays have appeared in um, Camera Obscura, uh, South Asian Popular Culture, and other collections such as Movies, Moves, and Music, The Sonic World of Dance Films, and um, are also forthcoming in The Black Wool Companion to Indian Cinema, and The Women Film Pioneers Project. And uh, the reason, um, in addition to her interesting research that we asked Professor Ayer to speak today is because she is also deeply committed to uh, introducing global perspectives into her teaching. And so we very much look forward to hearing how it is um, that you bring in important global issues into your research and your teaching today. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you all for being here on a Saturday morning, early on a Saturday morning. Um, and I apologize in advance, I'm recovering from a bad bout of cough and cold. So if I sniffle or cough during the talk. Um, but um, it's my pleasure to be here at the 2018 EPIC Symposium. And thanks especially uh, to Stanford Global Studies for inviting me and to Giovanna and to Denise Gerasi uh, for taking care of all of the logistics. Uh, of my being here today. Um, I move to my PowerPoint. <coughs> uh, given the focus of the symposium on integrating global issues into college curricula, and given my own disciplinary positioning within film and media studies, I'm in a film and media studies program in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford. I will initially speak broadly about the challenges and excitement of teaching world cinema courses, and then more particularly about my pedagogical experience of teaching Indian film in Trinidad in the Caribbean a few years ago. Through this alternating broad and narrow focus, I hope to unpack some of the theoretical and practical areas of interest that the question of the global has provoked for me as an instructor and as a curriculum planner. While my own research is centered on Indian cinema, I also teach survey courses on world cinema and have, in fact, made it my pedagogical mission to, introduce, uh, to include films from around the world in all my undergraduate and graduate courses. I start my history of world cinema course with a short writing exercise. And this, incidentally, is an image that pops up when you Google world cinema. Uh, and part of what I'm speaking to refers to this, uh, to what it's erasing and what it's including in this image. So I asked my students to take about 10 minutes and respond to a set of very simple questions. I asked them, what does world cinema or international cinema mean to you? Are those two different as well? Does world cinema and international cinema provoke different responses in you? I asked them then to cite an example of what they think is world cinema. How would this description change based on your own location, I ask them. What might a student in Japan or in Ghana, for example, think of as world cinema? Is Hollywood world cinema? And this is where they realize where I'm going with these questions. And that's what you'll realize when you see that set of images as well. As this short exercise usually makes apparent, Despite its all-encompassing democratic invocation, world cinema is not usually employed to mean cinema worldwide. Rather, its definition is restrictive and negative. It's non-Hollywood cinema. Just as is the case for what we think of as world music or world literature, and I know some of you are going to be presenting on world literature later today, underlying these categories is a binary logic of the West and the rest, us and them, Euro-American center and non-Western periphery. Why is the world always elsewhere in these particular epithets? 
Why, in fact, is it commonly to be found in the cultural products of Africa, Asia, South America? Why is European, American, Australian music, unless produced by their indigenous peoples, not included in the capacious sounding category of world music, for example? In typically referring to non-Western, non-English language products from the third world, from indigenous peoples, etc., the category of global is often revealed as the world as viewed from the West. Within this binarized disciplinary logic, the non-Western canon is itself formed through the conferral of prestige and recognition by the West. And here are some images. Whether through the Nobel Prize, the Oscars, European film festivals, etc. In foregrounding these issues in a course that students assume will be a pleasant cinephilic romp through some Asian, African, Latin American cinema, I pose world cinema as a theoretical problem. Stephanie Dennison and Song V. Lim remark in the introduction to their edited collection, Remapping World Cinema, quote, It is futile, if not hypocritical, to pretend that a loaded phrase such as world cinema can be value-free. And it is in bringing into play the power structures inherent in discourses on world cinema that one could paradoxically begin to throw light, however elliptically, on the question, what is world cinema, end quote. While there is inherently an us versus them differential at the heart of what we consider the global, the most privileged and pernicious of these frameworks in the past five to six centuries has been the West versus the rest paradigm. Deeply tied to histories of colonialism, a project founded on the framework of center, i.e. Europe, and periphery, i.e. the new world, new of course only to those who came from elsewhere. The academy, both in the West and in post-colonial contexts, often mirrors this framework in its curricula dominated by the West with gestures towards the rest through survey courses on world cinema, world music, world literature, etc. In my own undergraduate experience studying literature in Bombay, India, I majored in literature. I had courses on Shakespeare, the Romantic poets, American literature, British modernism, French existentialism, none on Indian literature. I'm glad that academic curricula have been debated and interrogated enough in the interim years that I'm now able to teach courses on Indian cinema to many deeply interested students across the world. But the work of interrogating never ends, and I hope to convey some of that process of the growth in my own understanding when I turn to my experience of teaching in Trinidad later in this talk. To return to the world cinema course, as we investigate power differentials that define the college film studies curriculum, I introduce students to Dudley Andrews' proposal for thinking in terms of an atlas of world cinema, whose aim is to model a set of approaches just as an atlas of maps opens up a continent to successive views, political, demographic, linguistic, topographical, meteorological, marine, historical, etc. Using Andrews' atlas framework, one could, for example, draw a map of cinematic power with hotspots of production density that would take us to India, Nigeria, Hollywood, or Japan, the big film production centers of the world. If we moved our focus from sheer quantity of films produced to critical acclaim at film festivals, however, our cinematic map would lead us to Iran, Burkina Faso, Romania, Cuba. Shifting Atlas views productively direct Shifting atlas views productively direct us away from mere models of scale of the large and the small, and also sometimes from the strict frameworks of the legal. If we consider, for example, how images travel through black market distribution, piracy, new media networks as well. And here are some books that are of interest in this area. And what of non-national cinemas, such as Palestinian, Quebecois, Kurdish, Black, diasporic, LGBTQ cinemas that might not fit easily into national cinema models at all? Andrew, Dudley Andrew, has a salutary message for his mainly American students studying world cinema when he notes, quote, rather than survey, which suggests a distant gaze, monitoring the foreign for our convenience and use, any study of world cinema should be ready to travel more than to oversee, should put students inside unfamiliar conditions of viewing rather than bringing the unfamiliar handily to them." End quote. Displacement and destabilization are productive processes in studying the other, so that films begin to be seen as projecting cognitive maps through which spectators understand both their bordered worlds and the world at large. 
Indeed, as these discussions make apparent in the classroom, our own subject formation along lines of race, class, gender, sexuality, regional and national affiliations determine what we think of as the global. A few weeks into such a course, I encourage students to design a mini syllabus that reflects their own version of a world cinema course, so that we may collectively reflect on what the global means to each of us, based on where we grew up, our ideological affiliations, etc. A football player this quarter, and I'm teaching a history of world cinema 1960s to the present course right now, so this is all very present for me. A football player this quarter suggested a syllabus consisting of sports movies from around the world and noted that the exercise made him realize the national affiliations of sports like baseball, American football, cricket, etc., based on which countries made commercial mainstream films about these sports. This then led to a class discussion of how the spread of these sports is intimately related to colonialism, 20th century neo-imperialism, racial and gender politics. What's he, he couldn't find very many films on women and sports, very many mainstream commercial films, and that tells us something as well. What started off as a discussion driven by his own favorite themes led the student to concretely grasp the issue of world cinema as a theoretical, political question. In an essay titled, What is World Literature?, David Damrosch writes, quote, World literature is always as much about the host culture's values and needs as it is about a work's source culture. Hence, it is a double refraction. Works become world literature by being received in the space of a foreign culture." End quote. This alerts us to self-reflexively contemplate our own habits of viewing, our development of particular cultural tastes when we encounter the other. As for example, when my students complain that a three hour Indian film is too long, while for me, having grown up on these, anything under four hours is a breeze. <laughs> and I often tell them the 90 minute duration that they expect a film to last is not a universal category at all. How does the encounter with the other tell us more about ourselves? How does a fictional universe from another part of the world orient its, orient its viewers to their global situation? Moving away from the dual model of center and periphery and attempting a polycentric approach to whatever our disciplines may be can allow for a positive decentered version or definition of the global. But no film studies talk can go on this long without movie clips. As a lead in to a discussion of transnational fan cultures, let's watch a song from a 2003 film, Kal Ho Na Ho, and its fan remake uh, from Germany. So I'll play the original first, a few minutes of it, and then the fan remake. <laughs> That is Shah Rukh Khan, the global transnational figure. Uh, where stardom continues to have this kind of force in some film cultures, and we talk about that as well. Um, here is the German fan remake, and I'll just forward a little bit into it. Uh, they have a preamble. They have a YouTube website that has multiple fan videos. Um, and they remake it shot by shot, gesture by gesture. Thank you. 
The shot by shot, low budget German fan video remake of the big budget Bollywood film song disrupts the assumed flows of cultural globalization, which is predominantly associated with westernization or Americanization, projecting the West as the source of cultural flows and the non-West in a reactive and resistant rather than a proactive role. As Ella Shuhat and Robert Stamm have forcefully argued, unthinking Eurocentrism can make us aware that not all cinematic influences and reference can be traced back to Hollywood or to European cinema. Championing a polycentric multiculturalism, they demand a decentering of the discussion by calling attention to other traditions, other cinemas, and other audiovisual forms. Locating film cultures in local pre-cinematic storytelling traditions is as critical as locating them within a technological history of the medium, which has, within film history thus far, centered around Edison in America and the Lumiere brothers in France, over-determining the Western origins of the medium. I find more interesting the German filmmaker Alexander Kluger's observation, quote, Cinema has existed for over 10,000 years in the minds of human beings, in the form of associative currents, daydreams, sensual experiences, and streams of consciousness. The technical discovery only made it reproducible." End quote. Sorry. The epic form of popular Indian cinema with its unruly, genre-defying mixture of melodrama, song and dance, action and comedy has often been seen as an anomaly in world cinema, as defiant of Hollywood's genre-defined regime. However, understanding that this popular cinematic tradition draws not only from Hollywood and other popular cinemas, but also from a rich South Asian heritage of oral and written storytelling forms complicates the story and demonstrates the advantage of examining cultural products with an eye to their complex ecologies. Here, for example, are a group of women in Bangladesh singing aloud an epic poem in accompaniment to a scroll painting that we, that we may read as a proto-cinematic celluloid uh, strip. And I'll play a part of this video. There are multiple things happening here. It's happening in a village. There is a woman who knows the epic poem and is telling the story as she unfurls these scrolls. The community joins in with her in the chorus. And this is one of the, one of the forms of storytelling that has been seen within the South Asian cinematic traditions as a proto-cinematic influence. It's interesting that those of us who study Indian film history have actually never watched a real telling of this kind of scroll painting as well. So it alerts us to our own metropolitan locations where when we see something like this on Facebook, we get really excited because it gives us a sense of the real India, the real South Asia. But we ourselves are distant from it, even as we are encouraging our students to understand what the, what the ramifications of studying the global are. Right? So there are layers and layers of privilege at work here. 
At work in South Asian cinema are different aesthetic criteria for a work of art and its desired effects on spectators. The rasa theory adumbrated in ancient and medieval treatises on Indian aesthetics, for example, rejects Aristotelian unities of time and place and promotes a succession of modes of affect rather than dramatic development of narrative. And those are the nine rasas or affects that a work of art is supposed to take you through, not just as the audience, but also as the performer. So the performer is expected to experience these emotions as they perform for an audience. This is not to say that popular filmmakers spend their time reading up on medieval Indian aesthetics, but rather <laughs> that this complex ecology of influences produces a cinema that emphasizes not what will happen next, but how things will happen. And that takes us through a series of affects, a cinema of multiple attractions. As Lucia Nagib notes in her absolutely wonderful essay towards a positive definition of world cinema, quote, the belief in a center is as mythic as the quest for origins. I would favor a method in which Hollywood and the West would cease to be at the center for film history, and this would be seen as a process instead with no single beginning, end quote. Such a polycentric approach to film studies focuses on exploring the interconnectedness of cinematic practices and cultures, on hybridity, transculturation, and border crossing. When read in this way, the category of world cinema begins to vibrate with nomadic energy. To summarize this first part of my talk then, here's a rather text-heavy slide. Um, if we were to rethink world cinema, and one could use this to think about other disciplines that one is engaged with, um, there are three nodes in which we could question uh, how the global changes a discipline. One is the disciplinary formation itself. Uh, in that film and media studies, as most uh, disciplinary formations in the West, are mainly US and Eurocentric. Other cinemas are often lumped into area studies. So if you study South Asia, then you study all of its cultural forms, or you go to your East Asian studies department just to do that Chinese cinema course, right? Um, the, the, a part of what emerges from this kind of disciplinary formation is that film theory tends to have this kind of universal approach to all film objects from across the world. So you might have, for example, Laura Mulvey's theory of the male gaze, which is then assumed to be operative across all cinemas, across Latin American cinemas, and for all time as well. So there are spatio-temporal questions at work here, right? We need to realize that theory emerges as well from particular cultural forms and cannot be just applied onto other forms uh, that emerge from other places and times. In terms of methodology, and, and world cinemas are often seen as incapable of generating their own theory. A student in my Indian cinema class this quarter asked if he could turn to a book on global film theory because he was so interested in the readings we were doing in this class. And I looked and there isn't a book like that. It is the big tomes on film theory continue to be mainly American and European centric. And only in these quote unquote area studies class do you encounter theory from other parts of the world. Um, text and context. So sensitivity to not just that particular text, but to the context from which it emerges is extremely important. So watching those women in Bangladesh singing along with the scroll did something to shift my own understanding of South Asian cinemas after 10 years of working on it. So this context is constantly getting more and more enriched uh, and one has to work to how much work is involved, that the global is not something that you easily access and then come back to the comfort of your own milieu. Um, and uh, so the importance of interdisciplinarity and the labor that it requires to learn languages, to learn the cultural milieus from which a particular text emerges, socio-political context, etc. Otherwise, there is a tendency to fetishize the object from elsewhere as well. Um, and then the perspective which I've been gesturing towards to move from the dual model towards a polycentric approach <coughs> sorry, and connected rather than uh, comparative histories, um, which some of you might be aware, the, the historian Sanjay Subramaniam has emphasized, it is imperative that we quote, not only compare from within our boxes, but spend some time and effort to transcend them, not by comparison alone, but by seeking out the at times fragile threads that connect the globe. End quote. This attention to the permeability of what are often assumed to be closed cultural zones serves to contaminate neat categories and to understand regions and forms dialectically, 
as always already plugged into some network, some process of circulation. Taking rooted cosmopolitanism and critical regionalism, these are terms that a lot of this literature then kind of refers as, as places we could go to. Um, taking these as our methodological guiding forces, we may concur with Lucia Naguib when she says, quote, world cinema is simply the cinema of the world. It has no center. It is not the other, but it is us. It has no beginning and no end, but is a global process. World cinema as the world itself is circulation, end quote. And she talks about how Hollywood gets short shrifted as well if we turn it only into the center. The complexity of Hollywood gets erased or, or of whatever the construction of the West is becomes this monolithic, uh, non-nuanced kind of understanding. Now to turn to the India-Trinidad connections. When we move away from the West-Rest binary and identify multiple centers, no part of the world is rendered peripheral. We may then imagine flexible geographies and consider other globalisms, including much ignored connections between what are referred to as global south locations. From fixed <coughs> borders, we may reorient ourselves to waves of influence that lap against the shores of various lands. But this is a very languid, calming image to think about waves lapping against lands. <laughs> Let us remember as well that often, cultural influence is not quite so sanguine, but is accompanied by force, coercion, and a hegemonic impulse. Let us not forget to always query the power differentials when we discuss global cultural flows. Where are these flows stopped, interrupted, diverted, co-opted? What happens in the interstices of different cultures? My first tenure track job four years ago was at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad, and it looks as gorgeous as it does there, um, where I spent a year teaching in the film department. One of the courses I taught and was expressly hired to teach was on Indian cinema. In the time that has followed, I've often been asked about my experience teaching in Trinidad and have always thought back to the intensely invested and sometimes fractious responses to some of the films we watched and discussed in that Indian cinema course. This work is the beginning of an attempt to engage with these responses and of what I hope will become a more extended examination of the meanings that popular Indian cinema accrues in what have been called the old Indian diasporas of the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, and Southeast Asia. And that's a very different diaspora, as I'll discuss, from the new diasporas, say, in the, in the US and in Europe in the 20th century. Analyzing pedagogy requires us to attend to the student, the content and context of the course, and equally to the instructor. My mixed-race, multi-ethnic Indian cinema class of 30-odd students included, I'll move back to that slide, included Afro, Indo, Chinese, Syrian, Red, and White Trinidadians. Syrian in Trinidad is a broad descriptor of immigrants from the Middle East. Red of Hispanic immigrants or mixed race light skinned Trinidadians. While white Trinidadians or local whites are the descendants of European settlers. And you have this entire mix, what they call a rainbow of brown in the classroom and in, Trin and in the Caribbean in general. My identity in the Indian cinema class was positioned between being a native informant born and raised in India, an India Indian in Trini speak, <laughs> and, a U and a US trained academic. They would always wonder where did modernity accrue to me? Could I, could I really be modern? Could, be, could I be read as modern if I came from India, which for them was this backward land that had been, uh, that had been left uh, in the previous century and yet that they had major nostalgia for, so a very complicated relationship. Teaching Indian cinema as a newly minted PhD in the entirely new and yet seemingly familiar context of Trinidad, it looked so much like tropical India. Um, how did I read and position my students? These weren't the predominantly white Western Pennsylvanian students who were encountering Indian cinema for the first time at the University of Pittsburgh where I did my graduate work. They weren't the familiar with Indian cinema studies students at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi where I was guest faculty for a semester. And they were different as well from the second generation Indian students I often encounter in my Indian cinema courses at Stanford now. As I discovered, these varying contexts and performances of pedagogical identities deeply informed the ways in which I teach Indian cinema. 
As Indian film studies grows as a sub-discipline of film studies, and notice how it gets termed as a sub-discipline of film studies, and sometimes within area studies departments, this becomes an important moment for reflection on how our pedagogical strategies, assumed audiences, and their spectatorial contexts produce varying historical narratives, canons, and syllabi. Bollywood has become a familiar other to Hollywood in movie theaters and in academia. How do we complicate the narrative by examining its pleasures, but also its hegemonies in varied different viewing contexts? How do we tell these tales of love and recrimination across the global south? To provide a very quick gloss on the Indo-Trinidadian community, part of what Tejaswani Niranjana refers to as subaltern diasporas, Manas Re as plantation Raj diasporas, because a lot of these were indentured labors taken to the sugar plantations, and you see an image there of them working on the sugar plantation, and Tina Ramnarayan refers to as the old Indian diaspora. These were Indians who migrated to the Caribbean, Fiji, and Mauritius as indentured or contracted labor from 1938 to 1917, 1838 to 1917, to work on British sugar plantations. Today, they constitute one of the two major ethnic groups in Trinidad at 35% of the population, with Afro-Trinidadians making up another 35. Political lines are drawn along these two major racial groups, with the East Indian-dominated United National Congress, one political party, and the African-led People's National Movement, which is currently in power. It's been oscillating between these two parties for the past two decades. Turning to the history of Indian cinema in Trinidad, Hindi films arrived in Trinidad and Tobago in 1935, and as for other plantation Raj diasporas, they became the most important source for the imagination of the motherland. Note that three Indo-Trinidadians Gokul Mia, Timothy Rudal, and Sharan Tilak Singh controlled the island's cinema business, the, the entire cinema business of Trinidad and Tobago, starting from the 1930s. Radio Trinidad broadcast Indian film songs in the 1940s, while India's Minister for Information and Broadcasting, B.V. Keskar, someone we consider a big villain when we do our film history of the 40s and the 50s, he had banned Hindi film music on All India Radio, thinking of it as trashy, not that, that, because India had this pedagogical post-colonial impulse to train its citizens in the classical arts, and popular film was seen as completely trashy. But in Radio Trinidad, it was being played. During the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, several orchestras were established that included Indian film music in their repertoires. And in 1976, the state television network, Trinidad and Tobago Television, began to broadcast Hindi films every Sunday afternoon. So the whole nation was watching Hindi films. While Hindi film music permeated the Caribbean soundscape through chutney music and soca, or soul calypso, the 1990s saw a resurgence of interest in Hindi cinema with the newly named Bollywood's employment of wealthy Indian diasporic characters some images here from posters and from Austrian Bollywood nights. Um, notably, these films never included these, the subaltern diaspora from the old diasporas. They were often set in London, New York, etc. Um, and this became a site for the promotion of cultural nationalism. The appropriation of this new form of popular Indian cinema, the big budget Bollywood, as an exclusive marker of Indo-Trinidadian identity versus a broader Trinidadian identity, and particularly of Hindu members, so people who belonged to the religious affiliation or affiliated themselves with Hinduism, needs to be understood in the context of what Peter Manuel identifies as the cultural revival and ethnic self-awareness that has accompanied the economic and political empowerment of Indo-Trinidadians since the 1970s. So there has been a shift within the diaspora where they've accrued more economic and political power in the, in the last four or five decades. Here is a quote from a student in my Indian cinema class. I thought for a symposium devoted to teaching, I should bring in some of my students so you experience their presence as well. K3G, which is Kabhi Khushi Kabhi Gum, and HAHK, Ham Aapke Hai Gone, I put the posters up there, were among the films I was made to watch religiously so I could understand and practice the codes of an ideal Indian family. Remember the scene where Yash tells Rahul, these are the main characters in the film, Never take a step in life that will bring shame to your family name or prestige. Promise me that you will follow the traditions of the family. 
My family are wealthy Indo-Muslim business people in the village of Barakpur and the family name Salamat has a high status. While the older generations understood the importance of family traditions and status, K3G assisted that film there, assisted in embedding these values among the newer generations. It became our social and cultural duty to absorb the Indianness of the only link to our ancestral homeland. So Bollywood becomes then the only link to the homeland. And a lot of indo Trinidadians reported visiting India uh, at least once in their life for those who could do it. And they were really glad that they had their ancestors had left India when they did. Because they, had, they were projecting the same Western notions upon what they saw as a place that was more third world than they were, that was economically underprivileged. They, 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 they would all comment on the poverty in India. Um, Siddhika goes on, um, where was I? Siddhika was among the most enthusiastic of my students at the University of the West Indies. This quote is from one of the assignments where students were offered a choice among a range of topics, one of them being to discuss the exhibition reception and impact of Indian cinema in Trinidad and Tobago through personal narratives of family members and friends. So I'd asked them to think about it. I didn't think I would ever be using this material. Um, Siddhika goes on in the same essay to discuss the film K3G and marriage within her extended family. My aunt Wendy married a British African against her parents' will and faced the consequences of family, fa familial rejection. My family shunned her for the interracial marriage. They based their decision on the same principles as Yash in K3G. An arranged marriage is not one of the traditions I adhere to as I prefer to find my own match. Nevertheless, I know what the traditions of my family are and I would seek out someone who is Indian and who my parents would, my elders would accept. It gives you a sense of how much Bollywood, how much a Hindu right Bollywood ideology has penetrated uh, into some of these spaces. It, this really, Siddhika had a more complicated response than I'm suggesting here as well. In the classroom, sentiments like these, even if not explicitly articulated by students, were read as symptomatic of the Indo-Trinidadian cathexis to popular Hindi cinema as a mode of cultural and ethnic demarcation from Afro-Trinidadian culture and society. Some student responses initially mirrored the broader public discourse around popular Hindi cinema, caught between attraction and dismissal as non-modern, irrational, excessively melodramatic, and non-liberal. This then provoked a discussion in the classroom of varying national modern formations and of the Afro-Saxon, a term used by Trinidadian scholars like Lloyd Best for the African who had been in contact with the West a couple of centuries before the Indian, especially in these particular diasporic contexts, and had come in to stand for the West and for modernity in Trinidad. So the Afro-Saxon stood for modernity, whereas Indian indentured laborers who arrived later were seen as belonging to, as always more backward. We see here a shift in the discussion of Indian cinema, modernity, and its relationship to the West, as articulated otherwise by Indian scholars in India. So this produced a very different understanding for me of Indian cinema. And the students were engaging with the scholarship. The focus on Creole rather than Western modernity is very different as well from the more recent upper caste dominated professional migration to the West by the new Indian diaspora and its responses to Bollywood. Conversations about nation and modernity inevitably relate to debates about gender, sexuality, and cultural identity. The discussions in my class of K. Asif's 1957 film Mother India were particularly instructive on how my students perceived popular Indian cinema's figurations of the relations between woman, nation, and modernity, and this figuration's influence on models of Trinidadian femininity. So Mother India became a huge talking point in the class. Usually in India, Indian students would groan at having to watch this film yet again. <laughs> in her essay on teaching Indian film in the Western classroom, Nipa Majumdar remarks, quote, the burden of representation or the weight of representational responsibility borne by the single film text lies heavy in national cinema courses, in which there is always the danger that each film may be taken to stand for much more than it actually does. There is the involuntary tendency for students to regard unfamiliar cultural objects as ethnographic documents that are representative of whole cultures. So they see Mother India standing in for India's articulation of ideal Indian femininity rather than one film in a very complex ecology. Hindi films generally in Trinidad have been appropriated by various social actors to pursue interests and power positions. 
the, through often stereotypical external as well as internal inscriptions and ascriptions. My feisty Afro-Trinidadian student Siobhan's initial testy response to Mother India is reflective of how cinematic representations of women and the female body have been at the center of Indo-Trinidadian discourses of cultural and ethnic demarcation. So uh, Siobhan's tubes, uh, which is the sucking of teeth, a gesture of annoyance or disapproval, uh, which is so Trinidadian, I can't do it. Uh, she said, this is why them East Indians claiming their women chaste, not going to whine like us at carnival. Whining is gyrating one's hips often against someone else. And so you see an image there. And I was hoping to problematize it because the man here is actually Indo-Trinidadian. Uh, so you see that these discourses of ethnic demarcation are actually way more muddled. But they were seeing Mother India as providing Indo-Trinidadian women this model of ideal femininity. While, as Tejaswini Niranjana notes, the sexuality question cannot be separated from the question of racial difference in Trinidad, so that Indian tradition and Indian women come to be defined as that which is not, cannot be allowed to become African, more recently, the anthropologist Hannah Klein's ethnographic work on female Bollywood spectators in Trinidad suggests that these opposing constructions rarely concur with the actual experiences of young Trinidadian women whose identity negotiations are much more complex and multi-layered. So even scholarship that's 10 years apart produces more complex visions of what is happening in Trinidad. Indeed, student responses to the articles assigned on Mother India added nuance to their reading of the film and complicated their, their, my own pedagogical premises in selecting this film. So responding to the article's discussion of shifting and unstable discourses of respectability for the Hindi film actress, and in particular, the star text of Nargis, who plays Mother India in 1958, she was a Muslim actress, the daughter of a courtesan, a visual icon of modernity in India rather than of tradition, engaged in an extended affair with her married co-star, Raj Kapoor, who you see here, Students began to, see, began to see her not only as the chaste Radha of Mother India, but as a much more complicated figure that could be read alongside complex articulations of Trinidadian femininity as well. Uh, so they began to appreciate that she's not just this one figure fixed in her meaning. Race, religion, class, and to an extent that wasn't entirely apparent to me, caste played an important role in the Trinidadian reception of popular Indian cinema. Consider, for example, the praise for the tedious and regressive 1999 Suraj Barjatya film, Hum Saat Saat Hain. This is from a Hindu right-wing columnist, Rajni Ram Lakhan. Uh, she's a prominent member of the Hindu Women's Organization, which is affiliated with, an organ with a very orthodox Hindu uh, community organization. She says it's a reaffirmation in Hinduism done through an exciting medium. It is a strong declaration of faith in Hindu dharma taking us into the new millennium. So Hinduism and futurity associated with going forward and modernity is a new formation. Just when you think Hindi movies couldn't get any better, comes Ham Saat Saat Hai to surpass it. And the film is really terrible. Uh, it's, being, it's being usurped to push a certain agenda within Trinidad, right? And in India as well. Compare this with something I find much more interesting, the Soka Calypsonian Ricky Jay's 1988. So th this is also generational, the change in how India and Indian cultural products are perceived. In 1988, uh, Ricky Jay, who's a famous Soka Calypsonian, had a hit single called Sumintra, and I'll play it, but I wanted us to look at uh, the lyrics as well. So Sumintra, the girl that Ricky Jay is uh, wooing in this song, rejects the noted playback, Indian playback singer Lata Mangeshkar. She says, hold the Lata Mangeshkar. And Mohamed Rafi, who is another very famed uh, singer in Indian film, and she says, and she, uh, 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 she claims her preference for the Calypsonians Crunter and Bali. Her Indo-Creole self-fashioning reinforces, as Tina Ramnarayan notes, the simultaneous prominence of cultural attachments to the island nation state and the distant, albeit culturally present, homeland. Uh, so the, the song itself is drawing on, on Indian music, uh, even as it's rejecting some parts of it. <clears throat> and it's a very 80s aesthetic. <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay. It's a tune that will stay with you. <laughs> More than a decade before Ricky Jay, the Afro-Trinidadian the Afro Calypsonian Ras Shorty One or Lord Shorty mobilizes Indo and Afro-Trinidadian idioms in his 1978 number Om Shanti Om, which my students introduced me to in 2014. I did not know that this is the original song from which two uh, Hindi films borrow. I'll just play you a little bit of this. A Hindi version of the song, and any of you who know Hindi cinema will know these films and these songs. Um, a Hindi version of the song appears in 1980 in the big budget Indian film Kars, which is then revisited in the 2007 Bollywood film Om Shanti Om, um, to play a short clip that will uh, give you a sense of both films. This is from Kars, but it's part of the opening credits of the 2000 film Om Shanti Om. Neither hugely popular Indian film gives credit for the song to Ras Shorty, and there is no mention of him anywhere in the mainstream Indian press, which is why this was such a revelation for me in 2014, years after I'd watched and loved both Hindi films. A YouTube commentator on Ras Shorty's video laments, quote, Ras Shorty never received his loyalties from the Kars movie makers for the use and plagiarizing of his Om Shanti Om song. He complained about it in the 1996 interview he did with Radio Tempo in Trinidad, end quote. While another remarks, quote, I saw the Bollywood remake of Om Shanti Om and I couldn't believe they, sold, they stole this exact song and yet they love to say our chutney singers are unoriginal, end quote. Like Trinidadian chutney music, which is a hybrid of Indian religious tunes, soca, calypso, R&B, Ras Shorty's Indian prayer to unite people as one was influenced by the religious Indian bhajans or devotional songs he heard in this Indian majority southern Trinidadian village in the 60s and the 70s. These in turn were set to Hindi film song tunes from the 1950s onwards. So devotional music is being changed by Hindi film music, which is then being picked up by an Afro-Trinidadian Calypsonian and then finds its way into Bollywood, etc. So the, these are the fragile threads, the connected histories that we could tell, rather than the story of Bollywood being the great other to Hollywood, etc. Right? The non-hegemonic presence, uh, the subaltern presence. We notice that in other places it becomes the hegemonic presence. Um, the circularity of borrowings and appropriations between Hindi film music, Indo-Trinidadian devotional music, Ras Shorty Soka, and the Hindi song in Kars and Om Shanti Om mobilizes multiple processes of creation and creativity, moving us away from reading diasporic practices within tropes of preservation or hybridity, and from assumptions consisting of clearly bounded ethnic communities. Tracing these influences through Hindi film music and Trinidadian soca led me to the Indian singer-music arranger duo Babla Kanchan, 
who gained fame as soca, calypso, and chutney performers across the Caribbean diaspora, Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname. A music arranger in Bombay, Babla first visited Trinidad with the renowned Indian playback singer Mukesh, you see them up there, uh, in 1967. He then returned to Trinidad with his singer wife Kanchan and his orchestra to do movie shows. Kanchan and Babla added instrumentation and melodies from Hindi films to the Indo-Trinidadian Sundar Popo's Chutney songs and popularized in India as well the Calypsonian Arrows hit Hot 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 in its Hindi avatar Kuch Garbar Hai. I love that woman dancing in the foreground <laughs> in complete abandon. These might be the figures on the periphery of the Bombay film industry, rarely recognized as Indian and not Indo-Caribbean by the numerous Trinidadian Guyanese and Surinamese fans through whom we can tell the story of love across the global south. Of course, these are never simple love stories, complicated by distance in, uh, in space and time, anxieties about originals and copies, preservation and loss. The Babla Kanchan love story with the Caribbean needs to be read alongside Sundar Popo's allegations that the Bombay film industry was stealing his material and didn't give him credit for it. So we should be careful when we're just celebrating these stories of connections as well. Okay, in conclusion, what did I learn from teaching Indian cinema in Trinidad? I'll just move, I'm going to skip over some of this. Um, through Om Shanti Om, Sundar Popo, Babla Kanchan, I encountered the multiple connections and cinematic musical mediations between diaspora and homeland. My students alerted me to the complex acts of translation between ethnic, national, and subnational categories, between Indo Trinidadian and India Indian, and about brown and black frictions and solidarities. As a discipline, it made me aware of the vast difference between Bollywood studies involving so called first world Indian diasporas that dominates the current scholarship and this subaltern diaspora, about which we know much, much less. One hears that diaspora studies is passé, I've been told this, that its moment has come and gone in the 1990s. But contrary to this post-diaspora sentiment, we still know so little and so much is changing in the present that has to do with the past. Hindi film spectatorship in Trinidad has not been restricted to a private viewing of films at home, as it often is in other kinds of contexts, but has been central to the production of public identity and performance of racial cultural difference through a broad cultural ecology around cinema. The island's engagement with Bollywood both reifies and challenges ethnic, nationalist, and post-colonial politics that continue to mark its political landscape. But more broadly, how might the study of Global South connections relate to today's discussion here of integrating global issues into college curricula? At a time when students are deeply conscious of the issues of race, gender, sexuality, self-reflexive interrogations of the category of the global can help raise awareness of one's own regional situatedness and deep historical relations with the other. Many of us have in our classrooms diasporic students that are double-voiced, double-identified, as well as first-generation students. Bhaskar Sarkar remarks about the challenge of conceptualizing the spatio-temporal contours of the global in a manner that, quote, grounds it in the practices of the local, a multilateral, fluid, and capacious articulation of the global to never lose sight of the global and the local together. Studying other worlds helps one contextualize one's own world, within a matrix of relational logics, interrogating exceptionalism, first world versus third world, developed versus developing, and seeing connections rather than differences between these. Students are usually very excited to make these connections, as I'm discovering, which transcend the vapid one-way logic of center-periphery binaries and produce rather a critical, a rooted cosmopolitanism. Thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Yes, and I will pass the microphone around. OK. Are there any 
questions for our speaker? Thank you for the wonderful talk. I don't think it's out. Okay, it? it's out there. Um, <coughs> I wanted to talk, and I'm, I was glad you ended with I just how about how those of us in the community college can can access mm -hmm. this world. And I, I feel like I'm on the same page. I'm an English instructor at Community College, and I feel like uh, you get me thinking in, uh, even harder about ways to allow our students to access the traditions that they bring into the classroom. Mm -hmm. Exactly where where we ended. Yes. Um, because I think that so often they have a kind of film, a deep filmic literacy mm -hmm. that um, is far beyond my own, mm -hmm. having been trained, you know, back in the days when, when it was all about reading a novel. Right. And it creates a kind of interchange. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it's, it's so much a, a, a question as a comment that I think right. that this can be extremely powerful because of the diversity in a community college classroom. Mm -hmm and to find ways to create and craft assignments that empower students to use those traditions and those literacies in conversation with other worlds that they know less about. But it's, sort of, it, it's a way to empower them to say, you know more than I do about X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I think that that's where your approach is really um, exciting, mm -hmm. exciting, and useful to the mm -hmm. and useful to, to those of us in community college. Yeah, so thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, thank you for that. Yeah, I find it absolutely humbling and uh, almost anxiety-producing to talk to my students about popular culture because they know so much more. Uh, but asking them to bring in objects, film, music, things that they're obsessed with. The football player, I know nothing about American football. I just can't bring myself to learn the rules. But then. <laughs> I, he comes to class and he does this thing and suddenly there's magic in the classroom because everyone else is engaging with him and they begin to have a conversation. So it actually decenters power in the classroom itself. It makes you less of the expert. Um, and everything that I learned from these students is kind of testimony to that. Absolutely. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I teach political science. And my question is around um, a little bit about how you teach this. So I really like this point you're making about polycentricity. And in political science, we talk a lot about center periphery. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's helpful even to teach that at all? Or just jump straight to this idea of multiple nodes and not even have students have that kind of intellectual foundation, if you will, mm -hmm. of center periphery? I actually bring it into the classroom. I make these, uh, so for the first four or five weeks of the world cinema class, they have readings on the particular films and cultures of that week, but they have this one broader theoretical kind of reading where we discuss the question of world cinema itself. And I'll often bring the most kind of punchy quotes from the reading on a PowerPoint and have one of them read it aloud in class. So they feel the full force of what we're saying. And, I, and I'll ask them how the films made them feel. Did it make them feel uncomfortable? Because some of these are, I show a lot of third cinemas, so films from Latin America that are accusing America of neo-imperialism. Hour of the Furnaces is a famous example. And I ask them, did you feel personally assaulted by this film? What was your response to it as someone who might identify as American and then let's take that conversation forward do you think of yourself as the center is this revealing something about your own kind of political ideological identifications there are students who are resistant to it um, and in the midterm evaluations recently I just got a comment that there's far too much reading to do in the class um, and I was thinking maybe what I should do is rather than have the entire essays bring in excerpts for them to read in class that might be one way to balance it but I want them to participate in the question of world cinema and not just treat it as um, as an occasion to just watch films that are fun to watch etc and the, and always tell them what we're watching is one film from Senegal. This doesn't give you an overview of Africa. It is one film from 1977. Don't, and don't always locate the past as backward and you have, that currently we are at the acme of modernity or whatever they might understand that to mean, right? So I find it important to bring the center periphery into even the national cinema course I teach, which is the Indian cinema course. Uh, because they start off with maybe saying, oh, this is so, this is so hackneyed, it's so melodramatic. And then some of them tend to move towards the other end, which is start fetishizing these objects. Oh man, I love Bollywood much more than I love Hollywood now. 
but you want them to be aware that Bollywood is borrowing from Hollywood just as Hollywood is borrowing from Bollywood as well. So, and it's an important time uh, when they're in college uh, for their own subject formation. So I think they'd like the respect they're accorded if they're made to think about and design their own little mini syllabi to come back to class with critiques of my syllabi. I make them think about why I have less Latin American cinema in my syllabus and more Asian cinema. It's because I grew up in Asia. It's because I know Asian cinema better. If you took a class with someone else, they would teach a very different syllabus. So why is that? Uh, so it makes me imperfect, but it makes them realize they are also imperfect. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you very much.